you're not spiritual, you're a politician. I went from the absolute top to the absolute bottom. And he went, oh yes, some people I know cannot stand you. You are like the first person that when they see you, they reach for the remote. I'm about to be a reality TV star. I really hated Kevin Spacey. Shoot the shit, Chris and yeah. Anne style. Angelie, how are you? I am very well, my darling. How are you? Yes, I'm good. I'm taking care to get your name right, because uh, once bitten, don't do that again. <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, Chris, you never got my name wrong. That never happened. Well, it's like I was just saying, I knew you as Ange, didn't I? And, and I, when we met, I was very Anglo-centric, so typical... English guy. Um, Correct. And so when you introduce yourself as Ange, you say, oh, it's Ange. And probably Angie, right? And Actually, back in those days, you're right. I think I did introduce myself as that because there was a lot of time in my life where I thought that if I introduced myself by my real name, which is Angeli, that people wouldn't remember or wouldn't be able to pronounce it. But now, if somebody can't pronounce it, it's like, you know what? It's three syllables. If you can't pronounce three syllables, I'm not the problem. Yes, it's that thing, isn't it? That, <laughs> well, I don't think anyone should ever be changing their name to make it more acceptable in another country or another culture, right? It's, we, we get the Half same- Half my family have. Go on. Half my family have done that. My God, you know, no matter where they've moved, so being half Australian, half Indian, um, like the, the Indian ones have, have changed it where, you know, when they've moved to the States or to the UK or to Canada or, or Australia and, you know, over here in Australia, I'm often called Anjali, as I am in the UK. And maybe it would be the easier thing to say, yeah, all right, fine. Yeah, just go with that. But I never will. It's like, no, I'm standing up for all the Anjalis out there. Yes, and you're doing a fine job. Maybe we should tell your listeners what happened. So, um, we were really great friends, um, but I always noticed there was something strange about you. There was something just not quite right. And I was only 22, 21 actually. Um, so, I didn't, you know, know much about the world or anything like that. And... You know, you always look like you were wearing your dad's suits, like if your dad was 30 stone. <laughs> okay. And they were always grey, like nobody could look good in the 90s anyway, but they were always grey suits. And you always, your skin was always grey, but your eyes were super piercing, like super blue. And I didn't think anything of it. And one day you came up to my parents' house. My parents were fabulously well-to-do and, you know, lived on, you know, the, the, the sort of the, you know, poshest part of Hong Kong, right on the top of the peak. And they went there and I invited you over and, um, you know, just had this great time. And um, uh, you told me at that time that you were, it was, it seems so sort of strange to say now, but I remember you saying I'm addicted to drugs. It wasn't specific. Of course, I knew, oh, my God, that means heroin. And that explains everything. It's like, yeah, in my wisdom at 21. Um, and I knew that from then on, I could never be friends with you. So when we got back to work on Monday, um, I was just like, that's it. All bets are off. No, 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 no. And... Um, we had a massive fight, huge, right in the middle of the office, huge, great big Barney. And I said to you, oh my God, why are you so neurotic? And you said, <laughs> you said, um, I can't be neurotic. Only women and dogs can be neurotic. 
And I went round to my side of the partition and I grabbed my dictionary because, you know, I had a dictionary, obviously. And I opened it to the word neurotic and I came round to your side of the partition. I slammed it on your desk and I said, get yourself fucking education. And of course I said, you know, neurotic. Um, people who have neuroses or something like that. That was the last one we ever spoke to each other. It was in a fury and I quit later that day. Um, and I never... I, I don't think I ever saw you again, but as the years passed, I thought about you sometimes. And then I thought about you more than sometimes. And then I thought about you really frequently. And I would try to look you up on everything. And there was no Chris Thrall anywhere, no socials, no nothing, zero. And I would tell you know people who were close to me, I'm desperately trying to find my old friend. I, he's he's dead. I think he's dead. Um, and then one day, like eight years ago, it just popped up by chance on my Twitter feed. The, the number one book on Amazon that week was Eating Smoke by Chris Thrall. And it was like, that's an unusual name. I looked you up on Facebook there you were i messaged straight away and not one minute passed before you messaged back and i burst into tears i burst into tears honey and you know for them for us to talk i mean this is so many years ago and it still kind of gets me um when you said um you know it, if you read my book um you're in it i was like what what and he said yeah your name's kerry oh my god so cool so reading the book and it's um, essentially a replica of what happened that day at my parents' house in the peak, except then it was much more negligee and I'm in my dressing gown tonight and it's much more sort of Vegemite stains and, um, <laughs> you know, just been to the gym rather than, you know, lace. But um, it just, it still blows my mind, honey, that not only that you have written the most tremendous works that you're fucking alive Chris that you're alive I seriously thought you were dead well I I probably should have been after uh after we saw each other for the last time things yeah things um yeah <sighs> What can I say? Oh, they took a turn much. turn for the interesting. Um, I know, but isn't it just so funny that even though we were only in each other's lives day to day for a very short period of time, you were so heavily in my heart. And obviously, you know, if I made it into your book, I was with you too. Just so strange to think that sometimes people can be in your life for just a moment, but but it's it's not it's so much more than that yes it's so much more that 20 years later or 15 years later you can write a book and you're going to put all these people in <laughs> in it um yeah you were like the most beautiful girl i'd ever met <laughs> really you should get out more well it, thanks honey well it was an interesting time wasn't it would you ever get back to hong kong yeah i'd love to i went back in 2011 believe it or not did you yeah um, anybody there that you still knew oh god it was a bizarre experience um well, I went back for my book launch because I had a, my first publisher was a Hong Kong publisher. So, quick story. I get a phone call from Hong Kong one day. Hi, Chris, it's Pete. I'm the director of Blacksmith Books in Hong Kong. I've heard you're writing a memoir about your time, blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah. He said, okay, when you finish, can we publish it? So I was kind of, what, do you want me to, like, send you a copy? Do you want to, you know, what, what should I send yeah. you? And he's like, no, 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 we'll, we'll just, just let us know when you finish it. We'll publish it. So 
it was really um that's quite a moment in your in your life you know of course when you work so hard writing a book it takes at least a year that's weird then... oh my god i just there's only one book in my studio i've just noticed that <laughs> that's a complete coincidence yes well wow. crazy <laughs> oh my god but yeah so yeah that would have been the most major thing yeah it was but... well it was a, it was a big i mean I, okay i got to peel back a bit so when I started re writing the book, I thought, right, I want to write a bestseller. I don't want to write any any book, right? Hmm. Not not that people shouldn't write books. It's just for me. I wanted to write a, a of course. A good if you're going to do book. it, do it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it, it's quite a process. You know, you have to apply yourself. You have to knuckle down. You have to be. You have to have a um, a routine. You've got to learn an awful lot, especially for people like me that didn't really learn a lot when we were at school. Um, <laughs> there's a massive amount of learning. You've got to learn punctuation, grammar, editing, narrative, scene setting, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so when Pete said, we'll publish you, yeah, that was quite a quite a nice moment. Um, and then when he did publish me, I flew to Hong Kong for the first time in, what would that be, 2011, uh, 14 years. And yeah, it was incredible. Wow. It was incredible. It was just a combination of nostalgia, emotion, um, a bit of sadness, but only for the right reasons. Um, but yeah. Was Vince it, still alive then? Say again. Was Vince still alive then? No. Oh. So what happened was um, I phoned Vince about let me think, when I, I got back from Hong Kong in 96, just coming into 97, I phoned Vince around 2002. That's how long it took me to sort of get my, well, at least start to get my life back together and get, get my head back together. And I phoned him in Hong Kong. I got the number. I had one business card of a mutual acquaintance, Amy Wong, she was called. And I called her and I said, Amy, are you still in touch with, with Vince? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. She gave me his number. And I called him. And, and well, you know what it's like. Why? <laughs> Lee San. Lee Homa. Ho, ho. I said, I, I, said, I said, Vince, it's Chris. He said, ah, oh, Chris, how are you doing? When you come back to Hong Kong, i got company now. When you come back, I will make you director, right? And it was, um, <laughs> if, if people see how our, our French, I mean, I love Vince, you know, he was like a, a big brother figure to me. He was a... Yeah. a he was just a, a dynamo in the business world. Um, and the other thing he had, which is really special, is he had the ability to step between Chinese culture and, and mine to explain sure. thing, things to me. And, um, mm -hmm. and he never, you know, there must have been lots of times I upset him because I didn't know the culture. And yet, yeah, very, right. very rarely would he ever sort of, you know, um, tear a strip off me so mm. I called in to apologise is what I'm, what I'm trying to say and he's like yeah no problem come back to Hong Kong you know you come and work in my company and he'd started a, a manpower services company and so all the time I wrote Eat and Smoke I'm thinking about the people in it and of course I'm thinking about Vince 
and I'm thinking, wow, when I've, I've got this publishing deal now, I'll be going back to Hong Kong. It's going to be incredible to, you know, hook up, hook up with him. Um, yeah. It's just almost like a a dream come true, you know. I, again, for, for people listening, we finished on really bad terms. Um, I got so unwell that he just couldn't be, like, dealing dealing with me, you know. And he went from mm-hmm. being this guy that absolutely loved me to saying, yeah. basically, fuck off, right? Mm-hmm. So, booked my ticket for Hong Kong a week before... I called Vince's company, or three days before, I think it was, and um, the secretary answered, and I said, can I speak to Mr. Lee? She said, no, cannot. I said, why? She, she said, he died, heart attack. And oh I'm like, God. what? And somehow I got in touch with his former brother-in-law I think it was who was now a a director in his company something like this and he he explained it to me that Vince had some sort of heart disease Um, rather than get proper treatment he'd been going to a herbalist a Chinese herbalist and trying to plow on through as he always did Um, and uh, yeah that was a oh bit of a God. fuck, you know? Yeah. I just, yeah, that's I was, horrible. I was so much looking forward to seeing him. Mm. Um, yeah, there you go. But what I did do is I met up with his former wife while I was over there. Are you frozen? Oh. Oh, now you're back. Now you're back. <laughs> yeah. So I I met up with Miss Lynn, who was his former wife. She came to my book launch. um, And then we spent a day together traveling. Uh, We traveled to Larmor Island, which is where Vince's ashes were scattered. Um, Yeah. Funny life, isn't it? The world, Larmor Island. Did you spend much time there? Lots of spirits around there. And Vince would be one. Yes. I love Llama Island. Um, it hasn't. Yeah. It really hasn't changed much at all. No, it hasn't. It's the one part of Hong Kong that hasn't. Yeah. My memory of you leaving Hong Kong, I thought you'd, you'd got a job with MTV, but you've you've gone on to do so much more. Oh, I suppose I did. So I quit the computer components company um, right after I that. That was it for me. I was out. Um, and I, I know that I would always tell you, um, I'm going to be a TV presenter and that's all there is to it. Um, and some people went, yeah, okay. And, and some people went, yeah, you know what you are. And the latter people, um, uh, were the ones who are right because I did, I, um, went off and got my first TV internship and from uh, you know some swings and roundabouts um, eventually found myself as um, an anchor for Sky News in the UK and then I got poached from Sky which is the hardest job that anybody will ever do in TV and I got poached by CNN and so I became an anchor for CNN for years and years and years and and that's what I am. I'm a, a television news journalist and I've, you know, covered every sort of, you know, breaking thing in the last, I don't know, 15 years. And Yeah, I I didn't doubt you. I, I think I was the opposite. I, I thought, did. yeah, that, that's probably what you're going to do. You um, never doubted me, Chris. Well, but it's also... <sighs> what can you say? You, you had that... I don't say background, that sounds a bit patronising because I think we've all had our fair share of ups and downs growing up. I mean, even, oh, yes. bo- even boarding school isn't, isn't easy, is it? Um, Depends. For, for me, it was. I had a, a, a dream run. Um, but I'm, I'm like that. Like, I'm, you know, 
I'd, I'd never set foot in England in my life. And at the age of 11, there I was sort of, you know, dropped at this boarding school and, you know, mum went off down the sort of, you know, three mile long driveway back to Hong Kong and there I was. But I I loved it. I really, really thrived. Um, not everyone does, but I'm still sort of like that. I, I really enjoy being a blank canvas, just sort of, you know, put into situations where no one knows you and you can just be anyone, anyone. So, so I, I, I really loved it. And, you know, when people go, oh my God, oh my God. Like, you know, like I was in some sort of, you know, Dickensian nightmare. Like, oh, how could parents have done that? It's like, nah, it rocks. <laughs> yeah, going back to the, the MTV thing, when you first said, I want to be a pre- presenter on MTV, I didn't have any doubt because I can't really, well, I've got to, I'll do my best to explain it. There's a certain type of person, isn't there, that, that does, that the media is looking for. Um, not, not like a, someone that's off their head <laughs> half the time. Um, I, 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 I just all the time. <laughs> well actually yeah they, they, sorry we're, we're, we're probably it's kind of a job prerequisite these days Chris <laughs> yeah sorry we're confusing people what what, <laughs> what I meant is it, it's I said to you what does it take to get a job with MTV and you said I've got to go for the interview and I've just got to be bubbly and lively and answer their questions with a smile. And I thought, yeah, you'll, you'll, if anyone can do that, you'll do that. Um, <laughs> I did go for the screen test. I did actually go. And um, the guy who was in charge at the time said, um, so if you got this job, would you just like drop everything else? Like, you know, your whole sort of news journalism, dreams, everything you've worked for at uni, would you just drop that? And I went, no. And he went, good call. And so that was the end of that. And I didn't get the job. I didn't even get the job as the weather presenter on local Hong Kong TV. (laughs) Um, But look, you know, it was a bit of, being in the right place at the right time, but also look if um, somebody had told me that I would make, you know, my life doing breaking news, which means there is nothing on the prompter, zero on your auto cue. Um, oh, there's one word. There is one word that's left on you. You know, you're sitting there like happily reading away. You know, the auto cue. It's like fine. Nothing is going on in the world today. Bam. There's one word that's left blank sorry it, 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 there's one word that's left on the auto cue and it's blank and the word is blank and you go oh you don't think that i can see that it's blank it means breaking news you'll hear it in your earpiece um and someone's dead go and you just and at first you just go oh my god there's like there's no information there's nothing but you've just got to keep it going and keep it going. Keep it. If somebody had told me that I would make my fortune doing that, um, I probably would have punched them very hard in the nads. Um, but that's that's kind of how it all happened and how I got to be an anchor on CNN. And it just turned out that, you know, when just when you get thrown in and you go, I'm going to sink so badly, but then it turns out that actually you, f- you float. And it's like, oh, I can do this. I can do this on any topic that gets thrown at me. And I never thought that. I thought, you're right. I thought my whole future was in being an MTV VJ. Were, were the media trying to put out a specific agenda? Did Do you get told, right, keep within these guidelines, this this kind of thing? Yes and no. Um, 
And you'll only know when you say the thing that's unpalatable. You'll only know after you say it. Uh, Um, Yeah. So, you know, then you get absolutely rained. Um, But, uh, you know, I suppose it's, okay, well, you mustn't ever editorialise and da-da-da-da-da. But now, if you don't editorialise, that doesn't rate. Nobody watches that. You've got to be polarizing on either side. And that's a new thing for me to get my head around. Um, Because I was always taught you've got to be straight down the middle. Don't even make a facial expression that shows how you might feel about a particular subject or a particular interviewee. Um, And I remember when I resigned from CNN and I decided to move to Australia and get into you know TV over here. Um, I met up with my old boss who gave him a very first anchoring job, and he was um, is fantastic American guy. He was sort of you know famous for you know, reporting from Nam, blah blah blah. But he is still always reporting from Nam. Everything that he says, and so I was like, do you know Jim? Well, I'm I'm moving into a local market and I've only ever been sort of like international, like, you know, look at CNN, there were 220 million people watching me every day. Um, So, well, I'm moving into into a local market. And so, you know, I haven't really done that before, you know, other than Sky News, what what should I do? And he was like, Angeline, you've got to remember one thing. Okay, what's that? And he said, the people love you or they hate you. And I said, people hate me? Like going, oh, I knew that he would go, no, 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 I was speaking generally. Of course not. And he went, oh yes, some people I know cannot stand you. You are like the first person that when they see you, they reach for the remote. (laughs) Oh my God. But he said, that's the important thing. You can't be down the middle anymore even if they hate you they're watching you you've got to be really loved or really hated and so that's that's where we're at at the moment yes you can't please all the people all the time though can you you can't and that's when you're um i mean that's not that's... really thick in person like me that's difficult to take when you get horrid backlash you know on socials it's evil. Some of it is just evil. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? We kind of share this. Obviously, myself, not 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 on the scale that you must have experienced it, but. Um, well, have you? You every, anybody who puts themselves out there, Chris, always gets some crap. What have you gotten? Oh, I don't really get a lot. A, a lot, to be honest, Ange. Um, Good. You don't deserve it. It's just horrific, Twitter. Honestly, if I could take myself off it, I would do it in a trice. Um, But, you know, it's about to get a lot worse for me. Like a lot, lot worse. Oh. Um, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... um, What have you done? I always... (laughs) It's what I'm about to do. So I always thought that you couldn't get more reality TV than the news but um i'm about to be a reality tv star wow we allowed to ask what show i am um the newest housewife on real housewives of melbourne oh my gosh no yes um... it was not my idea uh but you know it's like sod it in for a penny and for a pound so that's happening Oh my gosh! No, I'm not even. A, I, I, I'm not a wife. It's, I think it's not an ironic term. So, like Real Housewives. Okay, well, all right. So yeah, it's going on, and you know what? Now it's like yes, sodding. Bring it, bring it. Yes, my gosh. I oh, know. So I think over there where you are, you've got Real Housewives of Cheshire. I think that that's like a, a big one, you're, but it's you're, huge. You're, you're testing the wrong, the wrong person now because uh, oh. 
Honey, I'd never watched an episode in my life, but they came after me hard. And so I went, all right. I said, no, 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 nothing good is going to happen here. No. And then I was convinced otherwise. But so, it's quite a, I mean, from what I understand, just probably mainly from your social media posts is Mel Melbourne is quite a it's a place isn't it it's quite you've got a bit of can we say hoi polloi a bit of um the click oh sure yeah, yeah we do we do I just didn't know that I was in it um but anyway apparently I am um but you know look it's it's a massive massive um series in in the US as well and they love the Melbourne version, um, but it's you know it's pretty scary going into reality TV with you know six other women and just going okay. And now you know handbags at dawn. Do you have um, to, do you have to play a role? Do they want you to try and be a certain person or? Of course not, Chris. That's why they call it reality TV. Occasionally, you get, well, quite a lot now you get re reality TV stars and. Hmm. Um, they're really not the person that they were in the program. It, that, that, that's what I was trying to say. Of course, absolutely. No one is, you know. I suppose to an extent, even, you know, those of us who, you know, who are TV journalists who, you know, do the news, sometimes there is an act that you kind of have to play. Um, there really isn't anybody who says that that isn't true is making it up. There always is an element of, you've got to have a little bit of theatre because the news is still, I think it's still entertainment. If it wasn't entertaining, nobody would watch it. And that doesn't matter whether it's you know, hideously depressing or you know, it makes you angry or whatever, it elicits emotions. And in order to, to elicit those emotions, you want to do that more and more these days, you've got to have a little bit of a, an act. Um, so, yeah, uh, look, we all do in, in, in uh, reality TV. Do you think that's going to be a problem um, with you're going to have like two personas? And so, for, I mean, just for example, you might be getting attacked on Twitter based on your, mm. your, your character in, in the TV show as opposed, mm. as opposed to the real you is that is that going to be something that's an issue god i hadn't even thought about that god it could potentially be i don't know i, I just know that i'm gonna get absolutely hammered um you know when it when it does come um but look i it, it's one of those things where i just go i'll never know because i won't ju i just won't read my twitter page but if you don't do that, that's basically a sackable offence. You have to engage. And there are going to be some really nasty, hurtful things said. And maybe it's a good lesson in learning how to let things wash over you. But you know what? At my age, it's like <laughs> most things wash over me anyway. Yeah. Um, how how much time will a TV crew spend with you? Is it kind of in, invasive, or is it is it probably uh, not not as much as the the, the public might not, think? Not as much as say you know uh, I'm a celebrity or um, I don't know Love Island or any of that nonsense um, or like Married at First Sight whatever not like that because. You know, as housewives, real housewives, we're sort of, you know, oh, you know, we've got plenty going on, darling. I can't constantly be on camera. Oh, my God, you know. Um, and so, look, it's 16 weeks of very intensive filming. But we do all have other lives. Like, you know, I've got my nightly podcast I've got to do. I've got like a whole bunch of emceeing, which I've spent years building up. That's on my main business um you know with tv gigs so much is happening oh and somewhere in there i have to take care of my son and my cats so you know all of that has to be accounted for but that's just me then there's you know five or six other housewives who also have super busy lives 
and careers and well some of them don't some of them married well um and but i'm sure they're, they're busy you know getting fake tans i don't have to worry about that because i'm half indian so that saves me some time there you go um i was back last i say last year because it's like 2020 didn't happen so by last year is actually 2019. Yeah, I was. I was back there and had the most wonderful time, you know, back in the, so the family seat, um, which is beautiful. So I took my son to, you know, Harry Potter World in London. And look, it was the first time that I'd been able to afford to go back to the UK since I moved to Australia. Because when I was at CNN, oh my God, I had three yachts I had a boat boy I had four club memberships um I had my beautiful house my son had his own maid uh we had our regular helper um you know and just like do you know what I'm bored let's go to New York yeah it was like like cash everywhere you know so I can't move over here after I resigned left my husband and then right down to the bottom zero zero got to a point where i had 17 cents in the bank and by that i don't mean i have 17 cents and house that i owned or a car or stocks i had 17 cents i went from the absolute top to the absolute bottom it was so horrific and so difficult. Um, of course, I look back and go, well, it was all my fault because everybody does that. And just, you know, I've spent all this time building myself back up. It's taken eight years. And now, you know, I'm deemed worthy of being a Royal, Real Housewife of Melbourne, hurrah. But um, so the answer to your question is that it took me all those years to be able to afford to take my son back to the UK and go, I actually have enough disposable cash to take the two of us back to Hong Kong for a few days and then on to Harry Potter world and then down to my parents in Cornwall um, and just have the most wonderful holiday. And I, I just felt so lucky, but I worked my sodding ass off. I've worked my ass off for everything, but that was really, I've never been so down. And it wasn't like somebody, going, you know, anybody in my family, whatever, going, oh, darling, here, here's a bunch of cash. You know, don't worry, pay us back whenever. Nothing, nothing, zero, zero, zero. Um, so everything that I have now, I'm so super proud of, and I've just built it from a nothing. But nobody would ever know because I have this accent, and it's like, oh, gosh, she's terribly posh, isn't she? <laughs> yeah, life throws these challenges at us, doesn't it? It's um, mm, life's rich tapestry. Yes, yeah, so they're not so fun at the time. God, no, nope, they aren't. Do you remember saying to me that your parents or your house's garage, which, yes. was, on, which was on the peak yeah. for people listening, the peak in Hong Kong is um, uh, a very prominent, famous landmark. What, how do you describe the peak? Like a sort of bit of a mountain, isn't it? Um, well, yes, it is the peak. Uh, it's called Victoria Peak, and the peak is at the top. Yes. <laughs> of a, um, I'm going to and get a picture up. If you live, you know, at, at the top of the peak, the higher up the peak you go, the more expensive the real estate. Um, and I was, you know, very lucky, and my parents, you know, worked there absolute asses off, and we had the most beautiful place. That, of course, Chris, you saw. Um, you know, huge, right on the top of the peak. Um, of course, you know, it wasn't always like that. And But when they reached the end of their careers, was. And every single day, we were just beyond thankful. 
Anjali, what, um, can yeah. we talk about your time with CNN? Because that's mm -hmm. quite a, you know, sure. not, ma not many people in their life are going to get a job as an anchor person with CNN. Mm -hmm. um, uh, can you tell us, can you tell our audience, the people that you spoke to? Because I know you spoke to the Dalai Lama, didn't you? Uh, I certainly did. Well, did you did you interview him? You yes, yeah. Yes. He spent the whole day with me. Yeah, you sent me the the link to watch it to watch the video. Yes. Yeah, so um, with that one, um, look, so on CNN, I had um, I hosted the Monday to Friday um, primetime breakfast show um, to the world. So that was. And it was prime time US um, evening as well, which was great. So um, yeah, a lot of people watching. Um, and, but you know, although I'd, I'd spent many years doing the news and all of that, that wasn't my, my love um, and CNN knew that. So they gave me my own celebrity chat show. So, and that was a weekly, weekly program and so, Whoever happened to be in the Asia Pacific, I would fly to them and do it. Essentially, this is your life. Um, and that was my absolute love. It was fantastic. So yeah, I interviewed. Um, and when I say interviewed, a lot of the time, it wasn't just like, turn up, you know, ask your questions, half an hour later, it's done. A lot of the time, these people would spend like, a whole day or just like hanging out or you know sometimes multiple days um and there were there were many of them who i feel so fortunate I was like oh my god whenever i'm in a hotel room anywhere in the world i switch on and you're there you're like oh my god you're like my comfort blanket to me it's like oh gosh my word thank you um so we were we it was like we already had a relationship a lot of the time before i got there um so look i had you know the most amazing amazing time with the dalai lama um he's just <sighs> there were other sort of you know so-called uh you know men of god who i've you know spent time with whenever it's like Oh, no, 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 no. You're not spiritual. You're a politician. No. The Dalai Lama or something else. It's... He's, the real, a, he's the real deal, totally, is he? Completely. And just like a totally intangible feeling. It's like something crazy has just happened here. And even my, you know, jaded male camera crew who've seen it all, it's like, yeah, whatever. You're just another person to us. We're just like, oh my God, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, so that we we had an absolutely incredible time with him. And um, there were so many others I absolutely love. Like um, I loved um, Rihanna and um, Gwyneth Paltrow and, um, uh, Jay-Z and Kanye West, um, God, so loved Roger Federer. He was amazing. He played tennis with me and I won a point, which he clearly let me win. Um, <laughs> um, I really hated Kevin Spacey, but it's okay because he hated me too. Um, yeah, there were, you know, all sorts of amazing, just incredible people. But you know how they say you should never meet your heroes? Um, I did, and we had a fight, and it was like heartbreaking. It was, you uh, again know exactly, uh, when I say it's Slash from Guns N' Roses. Oh, okay. You be Chris, you're going to be like, oh my God, of course, Slash would be your hero, wouldn't he? <laughs> Because I was such a headbanging rock pig, and I still am. What what happened there then? I mean, I I think I can imagine what happened, but was he having a bad day? 
Uh, no, no, we absolutely loved each other. Um, and, you know, the full on flirt fest was absolutely, you know, carrying on it was great. But sometimes, you know, you can get on really, really well with somebody off camera. And then the second that they see the red light go on, bam, you are the evil journalist sent there to skewer them and they are the sacrificial lamb. That's it. And it was a bit like that. Um, but because we got on so well off camera and there were certain things that I could, I was saying to him that he knew, he was like, how could you possibly know that? Because I don't present as the archetypal Guns N' Roses fan. Um, and so he was just really intrigued by me. So he knew that I knew things that I maybe shouldn't have. And then I started to ask him about Axel and the feud between them. Um, that had been for years and years and years, and he's never spoken about it. So he answered, you know, God bless him, he did answer, but it was short. And I thought, yeah, I need more than that. So I tried it again a different way. And he answered, but it was shorter. I thought, have I, have I got a third in me? Bear in mind, he's like under the whole hair and the big old hat and the mirrored sunglasses. It's very intimidating. Um, and so I tried for a third and he absolutely cut me down. Um, it's like, you know, if you carry on down this path, this interview is over. I don't play that game. It's like, I'm going to be sick. Because I still had half the interview to go. Um, it was rough. Um, yeah, really rough. I um, have but then that we made up. We did make up after that. Good. Um, but it, it was, it was, uh, it was not fun. Kevin Spacey and I did not make up. That was the end of that. What a dick. Um, <laughs> but look, you know, I, I loved, you know, lots of the fashion designers, uh, particularly Karl Lagerfeld, who oh, never gave wow. interviews, never gave interviews. And he was amazing to me, absolutely incredible, but did also you, um, the, the most you, intimidating person I've ever met. Did you give him any fashion tips? I did. I said, what the hell is with this, 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 this. This is, uh, <laughs> this is so last year. <laughs> I know. This is like not recherche. Do you find with the podcasting, um, it's different to interviewing. I mean, it should be. It depends because what, what the podcast um, is, because like you and I have just sort of been having like a chat like we normally would if we were just, you know, sitting at, I don't know, Bitpoint and Lankwai Fong. Um, not the Big Apple, we wouldn't be having a conversation at all. Um, but um, yeah, so look, like, you know, my podcast that I do, a lot of the ones that I do are incredibly structured. It's like, we're doing this many minutes for this and this many minutes for that. And after this, we'll do this. And then it's like, you throw to this person and then you wrap and the end. Ta-da! Yeah. Um, so it's, I can't remember the last time that I just did a sort of a freewheeling conversation like this. So when you say podcast, that's sort of like saying, uh, you know, when you do, this kind of television has it different to that kind of television. It's it's all the same thing. You're still doing the same medium. It just depends on, you know, the, the way in which you fashion it, really. It's just like a large piece of fabric and how you cut it. Yeah, I find to get people come to the podcast, and if they're sort of my age and above, I think they think they're... That's yeah. 21. Um, <laughs> I, I think they think they're coming for an interview and it's going to be, you know, chung, 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 chung. Um, yeah, I didn't. I had no idea. He didn't tell me anything. So I just thought, OK, it's just going to be a, you know, shoot the shit. Chris and yeah, Anne style. Yeah, I, I much prefer prefer the, um, the chat with a few, you know, structured notes or whatever. Um, but I had, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I, God, I had that situation you, you were talking about with Slash, with one of my guests once, and it, there was just this massively 
uh, it wasn't an awkward moment. Isn't the right, isn't the right word. Um, it, it all came to a head in one minute. And I think my guest thought I was trying to needle her on something. And anyone that knows my podcast knows it's just, it's not about that. You talk about what you want to talk about, the stuff you don't, <laughs> you don't. And if you say anything that afterwards you think, oh my God, I really wished I hadn't said that. We we can just edit that out, right? It very yeah. rarely happens. I think we've done that. Uh, we've only only done that once. But um, yeah, this... Oh, it was as if I was doing like a mainstream media interview and the way the guest just turned on me and went, right, no, you don't want to go there. And clearly, <laughs> the, <laughs> clearly the point I touched no. on was had, had some historic stuff with her, right? I mean, I, I, I know, yeah, yeah. but I wasn't to know. I was just answering an innocent, you know, innocent question. Um, but, I uh, know, Chris, you're so innocent. <laughs> yes. Yes, honestly. So <laughs> what? Um, what's the pressure like working for such a big channel? And the other question I want to ask is, do you get, like, let's just say you're cliche millionaire, Get try and get hold of you because they want to marry you or 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 stuff like this. You know, do you, do you get like oil shakes? Go ah, yes. This... Yeah, but yeah, of course, there's you know people who because they can afford everything and or they've always been given everything can afford you because you know everybody's got a price allegedly. So, of course, yes, that has happened um, a fair few times. Uh, and it's it's just horrid. It's nasty. It just, you know, even though I'm almost like, you know, uh, OK, uh, it was lovely to meet you. I'm going to take my leave now. You just feel like, it's like meh. I think I need to sort of like have a bath in bleach with a wire brush um it's it's nasty and it does happen to um like it doesn't matter how far up the food chain you are you know it's like people think that because they can to them they can have anything they want and you're just an any thing you're a thing you're not a person so yeah that has happened a, a bit um and it's not been pleasant but um you know just yes it's you're a dickhead and move on and that's it um that's it it's not you can go report them to the cops or anything um well uh, but you see the pressure um it's sometimes it, it it was like you know the veins in my head felt like that they were just going to completely explode it just <sighs> You know, and when you go, all right, you know, I've got 220 million people around the world watching me. That's not the pressure at all. It's the one person who's your boss who's watching. That's it. Um, but nobody can be on all the time. Like sometimes, you know, you do have an off day, you know, somebody dear to you died or something like that. You know, it, nobody can be on all the time, but you can't ever let on. And when you're in... So for me, it was Sky News UK and followed by CNN. They're both 24-hour news networks, which means that breaking news happens all the time. It can be anything, anything, which means you have to know absolutely everything. Nobody can know absolutely everything. No one can. So when you asked me before about, you know, whether some of it's an act, well, it has to be, it has to be, even for the most consummate journalist, because there, there are times in there where you have a zero information and you've got to fill somehow. How do you do that? You act. 
but it's of course it's like sometimes your heart is in your throat but what i realized is when you're in massive essentially flight mode like oh you're sitting right there going shit is it too late to call in sick um you don't realize what your brain has absorbed that you never knew that it did or could and all of a sudden when the adrenaline kicks and you are there's absolutely nothing you can do you have to do this oh my god your mouth starts talking and it's like I have no idea how I knew that. Oh my God, that's crazy. And then all of a sudden, all this information has gone in to your brain, which is the most incredible thing in the world. And you're actually fine. It's fine. It's like, you got this. You really do have this. And then when you get off set, sometimes you're flying. It's like the greatest drug you can be on just like oh oh my god yeah you did it did it you know even if you've been on for eight hours live with nothing on the auto cube nothing um it just it takes off but there are other days where you just go oh oh shit i'm gonna choke i'm gonna choke um but luckily somehow i never did yeah Um, you were you were really good you can see Thanks, that in, in your interviews. You were very measured, very calm, very professional, and um, yeah. But when I say I, I never did, actually, I did a lot. Um, it's it's not how you fuck it up. It's how you cover the fuck up. And I think I covered really well. But I definitely messed it up a whole bunch of times. Say the me. I think as long as you just keep talking, people don't realise when there's a, a screw up, do they? Oh, I know, but there are you know particular tactics that us anchors use when we run out of things to say, and um, uh, yeah, it's like all of a sudden, a, no one teaches you this. A lot of news, it's kind of circular, isn't it? It's the same information. You're just saying it over and over again, or getting some sort of. Yeah, like irrelevant filler in that's not really taking the story. I mean, basically, they don't know what's happening, but they've got <laughs> this bit of information, and that's what they've what they've got to work with. You've got time to fill, and you know, there's like what I've always said: no anchor ever wants to hear. Um, and I used to call it the KTG. It was like, please don't let the KTG, don't let me hear the KTG. Oh my god. It's when the producer gets in your ear because they know that you're running out of material. Keep this going. <laughs> the pressure. I know, I know. Or well, you know, they'll give you the symbol for stretch, like stretch this. And you know, if it's in an interview and somebody's giving you like monosyllables as answers. It's like, what the hell do you want me to do with this? <laughs> oh, that reminded me. Um, when you were asking about sort of, you know, greatest people I interviewed, that was the, the one that got the most hits on YouTube by far was the day I spent with Kobe Bryant. Ah. Um, which was, I don't know why it did. I don't know... And this is like, you know, when it first came out and over the years, people have gone back to that interview over and over and over again. Um, I don't know why, but he was just gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous in in every way. Big um, old flutter. Yeah, um, I'm right in saying he died in a helicopter crash. Is that... He did, he did, with his daughter, yeah, yeah. That must have been a bit of a bitter pill for you to to have to swallow. Oh, look, you know, every time that I've sort of, you know, spent significant time with people who die, um, you know, that I've, that I've interviewed, it always... It, it hurts, like it hurts. Um 
you know, and but more than that, you're just sort of thankful for the time, like the small time that you got to do a sort of like, this is your life kind of thing with them. Um, and yeah, that was, that was all for, just, for so many reasons, you know, um, but yeah, I just, you know, mm. I thought he was great. He was, he was one of my favorite people to interview. And it's nice, yeah. that, it's nice that you get this special connection with people. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it certainly is. Um, you know, there have been plenty who are sort of, you know, badly behaved and inappropriate and whatever. Um, but then there were those I absolutely loved and um, I just feel really fortunate that I sort of, you know, got an insight into their lives and stuff that other people don't know. Um, and that was one of the things that I'm most proud of. Every time anybody said to me, um, oh my God, no one has ever asked me that before. And it's like, yes, <laughs> nailed it, nailed it. Because they get interviewed all the time. And it's the same, it must be the same questions over and over and over. Even when I'm interviewed, it's the same questions and the same answers. And it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's a bit sort of rote. Um, so when somebody who's massively famous, <laughs> he's been asked every question in the book, um, but because I dig and dig and dig on these people, it's like to hear those words, no one has ever asked me that, is the greatest compliment a journalist can ever hear. Yes, exactly. You've asked me a few questions, <laughs> a few questions today that if um, I was being a journalist I would have dug much harder than that Chris Thrall uh, I would have dug so much harder yes you're, you're <laughs> um what do you call it spinning the tables on me which is uh -huh. great which is great when interview oh goes, goes Honey, wrong I'm gonna have to like go in a say I've got to put Izzy to bed go for it it's really late here it's like quarter to 11. oh wow um, well thank you <laughs> Thank you That's for staying up so late. Oh my god, no, I just gotta like get him to bed because he's like, he's still only eleven. Um but okay, so let's work out how we do a sort of like nice rap or however you do it. <laughs> um <laughs> it's really simple. I just thank you ever so much for coming on the Bought the T shirt podcast, but I also thank you for coming and chatting to me after all these years. Um I'm glad that you're, uh, what can I say, that you're not in this dark place that you, that you mentioned, <laughs> and I wouldn't expect anything less from, from somebody like Honey, that. I'm so glad you're not in that dark place that, you know, I last left you in. Yes. <laughs> Enough said about that. Read my book, folks. Exactly. And to our friends at home, Massive love to you all. Thank you all for watching the Bought the T-Shirt podcast. If you could like and subscribe, that's going to help us. And uh, see you next time.